So when it comes to experimental methods, what we're trying to do, unlike in correlational research, is we're trying to uncover cause and effect relationships. And experiments inevitably start with hypotheses. And hypotheses are simply predictions we make about how variables are going to affect one another. Independent variables are variables controlled by the experimenter. So for example, if we were doing an experiment on the effectiveness of different types of therapy and trying to compare them, maybe we were trying to compare psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, and humanistic types of psychotherapy, the independent variable would be the type of psychotherapy that people undergo. And we would, as the experimenter, control that. That is, we would decide which participants got each type of therapy. The dependent variable would be how much better people felt after the therapy that they got. And so it would depend on the kind of therapy that they got as to whether they were feeling um, a lot better, a little better, or not better at all. And the dependent variable, the experimenter doesn't control. You don't want to control that. If you did, you'd be fixing your data. You'd be cooking the books. But the dependent variable should be influenced by or caused by the manipulation in the independent variable. So let's go back to our example of comparing psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, and humanistic therapy. And perhaps we want to know which of these therapies is most effective for treating depression. And so in order to do this, we need to have participants, that is the people who participate in the study, the people who undergo one of the types of therapy we're interested in looking at. And so the way that we might get participants is really important. And ideally what we'd like to do is randomly select participants from the broader population. In this instance, the broader population being all the people in the world who are depressed. Of course, sometimes we have a population that's more convenient for us. Maybe we work at a psychiatric facility that has 500 patients who are depressed. And so what we do is we decide, let's take a sample of those folks and have them participate as uh, participants in our study. But in order to do that, how do we decide which ones are going to be in the study? Well, ideally, we select them randomly, not based on which ones are our favorites or who shows up the most for sessions or who pays their bills most on time. No, instead what we want to do is we want to randomly sample from the population, in this case the 500 people at our psychiatric facility, and maybe we want to select uh, 100 of them at random. And then we want to randomly assign them to the different types of therapy. So we want to say this third of the participants that we randomly selected will undergo psychodynamic therapy, this second third will undergo cognitive behavioral therapy, and this final third will undergo humanistic therapy. That way, our biases don't influ influence what we're doing and impact potentially the results of our experiment. A control group is a group that doesn't receive the experimental treatment at all, and we compare the other experimental groups to that group. So for example, maybe psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, and humanistic therapies are all helpful for depression, but the only way we would really know that is if we have a group that doesn't get the experimental treatment at all, doesn't get any kind of therapy, and then we compare the other groups to that group. And the group that doesn't receive any kind of therapy we would refer to as our control group. Now, there's a tricky component here. If somebody doesn't get any therapy, if they're randomly assigned to a group that doesn't get any therapy at all, but they don't have an activity that's comparable to the groups that do get therapy, how do we know that simply hanging out with somebody for an hour, whether they're giving you therapy or not, isn't helpful? So we might design our study to have a placebo control group. That is, we'd have a group that gets cognitive behavioral therapy, one that gets psychodynamic therapy, and one gets humanistic therapy. Those would be our experimental groups. And then we would have a placebo control group that maybe plays cards with uh, somebody for an hour. And so they get something that's comparable to therapy in terms of time commitment, spending time with somebody, but it's not one of the types of psychotherapy. Then we'd have a more fair comparison than if we just said, these people over here get no activity whatsoever. You see this in drug studies. So a lot of times when they're testing a new drug, they have a placebo control group that gets a sugar pill instead of the drug. When we do an experiment, we're concerned about its internal validity and its external validity. The internal validity is the degree to which 
the independent variable manipulation is responsible for causing the dependent variable results. And so if we have a whole bunch of confounding variables, other variables that might be influencing the results besides our independent variable manipulation, we might have a study that is problematic. And so we want to have a study with tight internal validity. On the other hand, we also need to be concerned about external validity. That is, to what extent does this study um, reflect what's really going on in the world? And sometimes when you create a very tightly controlled study in the lab, it's not comparable to any kind of experience in the world and it lacks real-world applications and validity. And so that's another thing we need to pay attention to. You want to balance internal and external validity. You want the independent variable manipulation to be controlling and dictating the dependent variable results, but you don't want to create a study that's so foreign to the way people live in the world that it can't really predict real-world events. Mental and physical health research the randomized controlled trial is considered the gold standard of research, and it's basically an experiment in which participants are randomly assigned to different treatments. And so, just as I said earlier, somebody might be randomly assigned to cognitive behavioral therapy, humanistic therapy, or psychodynamic therapy, and there'd be a control group. And that kind of tightly controlled experiment is considered a randomized controlled trial. When the results of randomized controlled trials show that a treatment is effective, uh, those treatments often get labeled as empirically supported treatments. So if we were doing research on cognitive behavior therapy for depression and we found that compared to control groups it was effective and we did a randomized controlled trial that found this, we might, after a number of those kinds of trials came up with that result, we might say cognitive behavioral therapy is an empirically supported treatment. That is, it's been supported in randomly controlled experiments and we can feel pretty confident that when done properly it's effective at assisting people with depression.